Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT. Is the pandemic essentially over? The numbers sure make it look so. And Thanksgiving in July in the cities. It's the 4th of July holiday, but one group is marking Thanksgiving this month, and there's a serious reason why they're doing that. But first, the number zero. It's not nothing, and when it comes to COVID, it's quite something. Zero has been the number of new COVID cases reported in Scott or Rock Island counties a couple days in the past two weeks. Zero has also been the number of new patients hospitalized with COVID conditions. So zero is a big number, but doesn't mean it's the end of the coronavirus pandemic and its 16 month unprecedented impact on the cities. We talked with Unity Point Trinity Chief Medical Officer Dr. Toyosi Olatati. Dr. Olatati, I got to tell you the truth. Seeing the number zero is a big deal. Uh, absolutely, Jim. It's uh, it's exciting for us. It's uh, it's been a long, long journey, and um, and we're, we're celebrating this at the hospital yesterday because it's been 372 days uh, before we got to zero. Uh, the last time we had zero was 372 days ago. So it's been a very hard journey, but exciting one because we've been able to keep people safe and people are getting better. Um, the community is getting safer and healthier. So that's exciting for us. Take me back a year because just before the 4th of July last year, I remember Dr. Katz saying to the city of Davenport, you can't hold the 4th of July fireworks. They were canceled because of public uh, uh, gatherings outside were thought of being very unsafe. What a difference a year has made compared to now. No, absolutely. I know this time last year, I mean, the parks were closed. We could not celebrate Ju July 4th, but this is different. And the difference is that is the vaccine. The vaccine has made a tremendous difference in, um, in, in what is happening right now. The safety and the protection that the vaccine offers is, is unparalleled and um, it's been shown. And that's why we got to zero in the hospital. So right now with confidence, we can say, yes, we can hold these gatherings outside. Uh, we see the baseball diamonds are filled up. Um, these days uh, with kids. So it's exciting. It's, com it's a completely different um, time compared with last year. And the major difference has been the breakthrough with the vaccines. You really do put a lot of the credit on the vaccine. So tell me about that because there's three vaccines obviously being used. Everyone knows that now. Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. Are you surprised at the effectiveness that these vaccines have had? I'll be honest, yes, I am surprised. And uh, uh, because We've not seen vaccines in modern history, or even in the history of medicine, this effective. And in general, we talk about 70% effectiveness, and we're good with that. But here we're reaching in the 90s, mid to upper 90s, and it's it's really exciting to see how effective these vaccines are, especially in this in the in the in the, in the pandemic, because it has been the main one of the major reasons, in addition to other safety measures that we. We, we have much less and much fewer new cases now. Um, however, um, it's also a credit to um, the scientists that have been working on this technology for decades. And uh, it's, it's just everything has come to fruition uh, with this vaccine. And um, all, all three vaccines that we use in the United States now, they are very effective and very safe. Of course, um, the Johnson & Johnson is a one and done. And the other two, um, you have to get a second dosage but even even then there's significant protection after the first dosage so um, these vaccines are uh, you know it's exciting to to see that um, they're available for us and we can walk in anywhere actually almost anywhere and get these vaccines nowadays so yes we have a, a tool that we never thought we would have this time last year but uh, credit to those who have come up with this it's it's a scientific breakthrough i would say you do say that they're safe, of course, and, and we're talking about, you know, 99% of the people seemingly not getting anything more than a sore arm after the shot. But we've also heard that some young people have had uh, uh, difficulties as far as enlarged heart, which is, is quickly uh, treated. Have we seen anything like that in our area? 
So in our area, we have not seen anything like that, um, at least within um, the unit point health uh, facilities. We've not seen um, those reactions at this time, um, but we are very vigilant and watching out for them. Um, we, we have all our staff trained to watch out for the symptoms of these diseases. And we share with the patients when they come to us uh, what to watch out for, um, because usually um, we have to watch out for these symptoms over a period of several weeks, even after getting the vaccines. So we, we are more alert and vigilant to this side, of possible side effects. And we're seeing more children, when we say children 12 and older, getting vaccinated. What do you say to parents, especially coming up to the school year? I mean, I know we're just entering July, but the school year is coming up and, and some schools are going to require more children to be vaccinated. So um, having the results of the studies done on 12 years and above, on the safety, it was even actually more effective in this population than the rest of the adult population, and it was very, very safe. Um, I would really strongly recommend parents to to um, allow their children to get these vaccines, 12 and above. It's been proven. Um, it wasn't rushed for that population. Uh, it's been proven. It's been monitored, of course, and um, it's been found to be safe uh, because one of the things that we must realize is that um, children may not get really sick from it, but they also interact with others. I know the whole not it's not the whole population that is vaccinated yet. We still have people with immune suppressed immune status that could be exposed to this vaccine to this virus. So the, the more we have people vaccinated, the higher the chance we know that we will we, really overcome this this virus and this pandemic. We can socialize more. Even now, yes, we are socializing a lot, but now a lot of the new cases are in this younger population. And it's, it's an opportunity to get vaccinated. I have one of my nephews, uh, 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 is one of the things I'm dealing with. One, one of them is six, 16, he, he got vaccinated. The, the younger one is still reading through the literature. And so we have, we have um, a lot of work in dealing with our teenagers and our uh, 12 to 18 year olds in terms of encouraging them to get these vaccines. They've seen their adults get it and they're, they're doing well. And so the, this, this population should also get it for sure. I love the fact that you said that he's reading up on it. He's trying to get the information. He's going through pamphlets. I mean, he's becoming educated. Yes, absolutely. And uh, he, he asked me a pointed question. He said, well, can it, can it really alter your DNA that he's concerned about that? And I shared it with him, OK, let's, let's look at it together. Let's look at what the facts are together. And um, really, that's what we're trying to do to encourage people to look at facts in making their decisions and uh, in coming on board with um, getting the vaccines. Well, I mean, there's also the, the, the issue of the variants. I mean, when we're saying that, that the virus is, is somewhat contained, I know as a, as a doctor that's at the end of a pandemic, you don't want me to say something like that. But now we have variants that could be uh, uh, exploited in the health system as well. Is that a major concern of yours? Is that this virus is just going to keep changing and, and infecting more people in different ways? So um, uh, this virus is, is not doing anything new. It is what viruses do. Viruses, they, they try to evade your immune system. They try to evolve so that they too can survive. Um, but what we've seen is that the vaccines have been very effective against even this newer variants. And even when there is some breakthrough infection, that is, it's very mild because the vaccine offers one the antibodies to fight off the virus. And even if you get the virus, it also prepares your body not to get really sick from the from the virus. So um, the good news is that um, the vaccines have been very effective even against this new variant. Of course, we are all also on the um, uh, we have to remain vigilant and still watch for whatever it may, may sneak through the uh, defense mechanisms. But uh, the vaccines have been tremendously uh, they've been very, very effective. And that's what we see in the community. I mean, yesterday in the in the whole of the unit point health system, there was only one positive patient. I mean, this compared with 500 patients just a few months ago per day. So um, I, I think um, the, the effectiveness of the vaccine tells us that even when variants come within our community, um, they, they, they've been found to be very effective against the variants. Since we're near the end of the worst of the pandemic, and that, that I think we can easily say, it's, it's a time also to look back. Um, hospitals must have had emergency action plans. You must have had a, a, a pandemic response plan that was written up 5, 10, 15 years ago. You've just now lived through it over the last 15, 16 months. What is the biggest thing that medical professionals such as you have learned 
from this pandemic and, and, and the, the fact that it lasted as long as it did? So um, I would say that all the emergency preparedness plans we had basically had to be torn up and rewritten on the fly. And uh, one of the things that we've learned is really there's power in working together um, because this, this, this virus was so new to us and it was so aggressive and we had to tap into every single resource we had, had, had in the organization, within the organizations, outside of the organizations, beyond the, the, the wall, the borders of the court cities, and even beyond the borders of the, of the country, because we had to, to get as much information from anywhere as possible so that we can put those together and do the best for our patients and our communities. So what we learned is that there's power in collaboration. And that second thing is that really, all the resources, especially in terms of talents and um, expertise that you need, you really have it locally here. And that, that was exciting to see how well we worked as an organization and even with our partners and our even competitors, how well we worked together to, to battle this um, pandemic. And, um, and going beyond just the medicine or healthcare industry, we went to other industries to learn from in fighting this pandemic. So that's that, those, those would be two lessons I would say we learned from. Here. And you'd have to admit also that the uh, the public health system and the hospitals in the Quad City area were pushed to the limits towards oh. the end of November, early December. Uh, absolutely, it was um, it was almost at a breaking point, and uh, which is uh, I still remember end of November, just you know pleading with the community to to help us to fight this uh, pandemic, and you know the response of the community, um, the was very helpful in helping us at least stay above water. We're very close to break uh, point of breakdown. However, the resilience of of the community, the resilience of the medical staff, the the the, the nurses, the public health officials. I mean, it was a joy really having conversations with public health officials, officials with our partners at Genesis at, and at, and other health systems across the the region on how we're going to work together to fight this pandemic. And I, I would say this was not a one man show. It was not just one organization. It was really the whole community that rallied. Yes, the, the health care system were at the forefront. The public health was at the forefront, but we're strongly supported by the community. So would you say right now, that for all intents and purposes that this COVID pandemic is over? You know, I would like to declare that it is almost over. <laughs> and the reason I wouldn't say it's over, over, is because um, we still have so many people that are not vaccinated. Um, I know our communities, um, court cities is doing well, but when you look at United States, you still have many states where um, less than 40% have even had a, a, the first shot. And I'm uh, concerned about those communities because we are one country. Things will move from migrate from one community to the other. So yes, um, we are we are much we're much closer to the end than we were um, clearly a year ago. But we're not there yet, so we have to remain vigilant. Dr. Toyosi Olatani, Unity Point Trinity Chief Medical Officer. Rebecca Kasid and Alan Morrison are a ukulele duo who take an interesting twist on five decades of popular music. This duo joined us at the River Music Experience to perform one of their original works. Here's Kasid and Morrison with Every Day of the Year. Other 
Kaysen and Morrison with every day of the year. The 4th of July is upon us, and that means we're at the height of summertime activities. And Laura Adams has some great ways for you to enjoy the start of the new month if you plan to go out and about. This is Out and About for July 2nd through 8th. Cole Valley Days kick off July 2nd at the Municipal Park with fireworks at 9 and family-friendly activities all day on the 3rd. The summer concert series presented by the Bettendorf Park Band begin July 2nd at 7.30. Quad Cities Ballet Folklorico perform at the LeClaire Community Library the 1st at 5. And Bettendorf's Independence Parade begins in downtown Bettendorf the 3rd at 10 with fireworks at Middle Park at 9. Red, White and Boom is scheduled in downtown Downtown Rock Island and Davenport the third starting at 5 and the Rust Belt in East Moline present Red, White and Bass Banger at 9 on the 3rd and the Genesis Firecracker Run begins at 6 a.m. on the 4th in downtown East Moline followed by the 4th of July Parade starting at 1. Geneseo celebrates an old-fashioned patriotic concert and social the 4th at 10 a.m. at the City Park and the Muscatine 4th of July celebration takes place on Harbor Drive the 4th starting at 3. Come out to Quinlan Court in downtown Davenport to enjoy a free patriotic concert, Stars, Stripes, and Saxophones, the 5th at 7. On stage at Circa 21, Beehive, the 60s musical, and for kids, Elephant and Piggies, We Are in a Play, continue. And the Countryside Community Theater in Eldridge finishes their run of The Music Man. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. We don't want to rush you through your calendar, but some people are all ready to mark Thanksgiving right now. Yes, Thanksgiving in July. But it's really a way to make a point and make a difference. We talked with the Associate Director of Churches United, Betsy Van Osdown. So Churches United, of course, is not going to be doing Thanksgiving in July, which is a great idea, of course, and you've done it for the last couple of years. You must really see food insecurity in the Quad City area firsthand. Yes, and it's always fluctuating and there we have it's like a roller coaster is the best way to describe it. Right. Because there's times that there's huge increases and then there's times where it will even out. I won't say if the decrease is there, it's a very slight, but then it's we usually have just a maintenance level and then it increases. Yeah, and, and let's be honest, uh, the summertime is a tough time because the big food drive that we always think of is the uh, student uh, uh, hunger drive, which is like in, in, in September, October. And then right. in May, you have the big collection, usually by uh, postal workers. All of that has been impacted by the pandemic. So the fact that you want to do this in July is just kind of keeping, you know, the buildings full during the summertime. Right. And six years ago, when I went to my former executive director with this idea, she's like, well, that has never been done before. And she says, if it works, we'll run with it. So I came up with it six years ago and it's been running ever since. And the reason why, when I first came on board here at Churches United, I could not figure out why the food pantries were struggling because we have oversight of 23 food pantries across all of the quad cities. And it's like, why are there no food? Why are they having a hard time keeping food on the shelves? Well, it's because their kids were home from school. Okay, now we had a pandemic year, so that's kind of throws a, makes it kitty wonkus, but still the kids were home. So we're seeing an increase right now of more need for food to be on the pantry shelves to help these families out. Well, and you pointed out, I mean, this is a big operation, 23 food pantries and two hot meal sites. The hot meal sites, I think you're happy to announce, are also reopening. Yes, we are so close to having the food, the food meals or the meal sites opening back up. We're excited, but you know, we we need to sit down with the two churches, Zion Lutheran in Davenport and Mount Zion in East Moline, sit down with the pastors and their um, team of directors and come up with a game plan so that we can serve the meals safely for the congregation, the church, the staff, and you know, well, our staff, and then the clients as well. So yeah. we need to make sure, you know, we have all of our ducks in a row, so to speak. Well, Churches United always wants to make sure that you're, you're somewhat of a safety net, um, that people aren't gonna fall through the cracks. But let's be honest, during the pandemic, where did these people get food 
otherwise? Because it has been a tough time over the last 16 months. Well, believe it or not, during the pandemic year, um, churches, you never, churches United never shut down. We were still boots on the ground. We were serving meals. Our pantries were open. They were giving food out the entire time. In fact, we were tagged by the Bettendorf faith leaders back in March when the pandemic first hit and nobody knew what was hitting us. And so the shelters had to be, had to displace their clients because, you know, they had to get them distanced. So, you know, for safety reasons and stuff. So they were displaced into hotels. Well, we were tapped on the shoulders and said, we need you guys to go in and feed. So between us and Adventure Church, Adventure Church took care of the clients that were displaced in Western, in West um, Davenport. We took care of the clients that were displaced here in Bettendorf and are on the border, you know, Bettendorf, Davenport. And within 14 weeks time, we served six meals per week. And with the help of Smoke and Pyro, Ray and Jen, we're so grateful for them because they prepared the meals and everything. And we served to go meals outside of the hotels. And we served over 14, over 14,000 or over 9,000 people in 14 weeks. And that, and that was, yeah, that, that's amazing. Six days a week. Do you think that really underlines the point of the churches in, in the Quad City area is to be there in, in the worst of times and the times of greatest need? Mm -hmm. well, our organization is made up of many member churches. And so collectively, um, we go out and we serve those who are in need and we couldn't do it without their our private donors and the churches and all all of the many 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 volunteers well yes and churches united not only many different churches but many different faiths as well many different yes. viewpoints as well coming together to help an entire community in need so how do people get involved in thanksgiving in july i mean what what are you looking for from the public what we're looking for is if you're we have Fairway on board. We have QC Corps, which is a chiropractic office, collecting food. Many churches are collecting food items. What we need is people who happen to think of us um, bring in donations, non-perishable food items. They can drop them off here at the office as well on Tech Drive. We'll also take monetary donations, and that money can be used to buy many, many more pounds of food than, you know, just something off the shelf. So, I mean, either way, all of it is going to go right back into all 23 food pantries. Well, and let's be honest, you've been so, pretty you've been pretty good at this because I was looking on your website it said in 2019 you finished first in the state of Iowa for the amount collected in the state. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I, I could pat you on the back, but I mean, of course, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's 2 years ago you want something new this year. Right. Well, I was very pleased with the numbers considering it was a pandemic year and I wasn't expecting much, but it's like, you know what? I've always said the last six years, if we receive one can of food, it this Thanksgiving in July was a success because that's one, one more can of food that we didn't have yesterday. And it can go to feed a family in some way, shape or form. So what it is, is there's other organizations across the state of Iowa and the two biggest cities are Des Moines that we compete against and Iowa City. They have a strong, um, is, they call it a different campaign, but it's the month of July that we do this um, food gathering. And last year, I wasn't sure what to expect because everybody was, you know, hunkered down and because of the pandemic. But the Quad Cities and all of its glory like it always does because Quad Cities is made up of many, many generous people and we're grateful for them. They came through and we were able to fill shelves of the food pantries because people were coming out still in need, still hungry. We had children that were hungry. And so all that food went back into the pantries and and so we were able to accomplish and fill bellies. So. Well, and as you point out, I mean, it is the summertime. You're going to see children out of school, and they're sometimes most at need right now, and you don't yeah. want them to be forgotten. We don't want to forget also that Churches United is marking its 60th year um, of serving the Quad City area. That's quite a milestone uh, uh, for the group, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. 
What are the, do you have yeah. plans? Are you, are you celebrating? Do you have a cake? Are there cupcakes? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> because we celebrated our 60th year in January of this past year, we were still just not quite out of the pandemic right. yet. So, yeah, but no, we're, we're just very proud and we're behind the scenes, but we're boots on the ground and yeah, we're still going strong. So I'm very, 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 very grateful. Betsy Van Osdell, Associate Director of Churches United. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. They now have live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service. At IHM VCU, we've always been here for you. You are and always will be our top priority. We care about your financial and physical health, and we are here. IHM VCU is a proud supporter of WQPT.